Welcome to Silicon Labs Zigbee Concepts Training, Part 3. In this training module, we are going to discuss more basic Zigbee concepts, including Zigbee node types, PAN IDs, and extended PAN IDs, and addresses. Let's start with node types. Zigbee has three types of basic node types. They are the Zigbee Coordinator, or the ZC, the Zigbee Router, which we abbreviate as ZR, and the Zigbee End Device, the ZED. The differences among these types of nodes or devices mainly come down to how they interact with other nodes in the network. First, we have the Zigbee Coordinator. The Coordinator is essentially a router with some additional functionality. It is responsible for forming the PAN, the personal area network, and therefore, it's also the first one in the network. In a given network, there can only be one coordinator at any given time. After the coordinator forms the network, it's not possible for anyone else to join the network as a coordinator. For some applications, the coordinator may have added responsibilities, such as being the trust center or network manager, but these topics are for another training module. Next, Let's look at the router device type. A router has the ability to not only send and receive its own packets, but also to relay for other nodes in the network. Because the other nodes rely on it to do routing, it's not available for duty cycling, meaning the router can't go to sleep and wake up at various times because other nodes are depending on it to get messages through the network. If you want a device that duty cycles, you will have to look at end devices. End devices are devices that don't participate in any routing. The only concept of routing is that they have to send things to their parent or get things from their parent. When I say parent, I mean there is some other router node, potentially the coordinator, that is responsible for that end device. So it bears the responsibility of forwarding messages out and proxying messages in for that end device. An end device relies on its parent for communication to the network. If that communication is lost, the end device then has to go out and find a new parent and reattach itself to the network through this new parent. In diagrams and other Silicon Labs Zigbee training videos, you may see circles of different types. The thick red circle corresponds to the coordinator a thinner red circle corresponds to the router, and a blue circle represents an end device. Now, tying these back to stack concepts and how one determines the node type. In the Ember ZNet stack, the node type is chosen via the form network and join network API calls. For example, if you have an Ember AF form network call, it will determine whether or not the node forms a network and this node becomes a coordinator. The node type defines are shown here. We have Ember Router, which is a router node, Ember End Device, which is an end device that never sleeps, Ember Sleepy End Device is an end device that can go to sleep and must pull its parent periodically to receive messages and acknowledgments. Note that if a sleepy end device sends out a message, this message goes out through its parent, and when the acknowledgement comes back, the sleepy child has to pull a short while later to pick that up. If there are any application level responses re arriving for this sleepy child, it has to pull the parent yet again to receive those response messages. If there's nothing there when the sleepy end device pulls, it just goes right back to sleep. The sleepy device is also known as an RX off when idle device, meaning the receiver is turned off automatically any time the stack is idle. Remember that this is all managed inside of the Ember ZNet stack, so you don't have to worry about it, when to shut the radio off, or when to turn it on. Now let's talk about the PAN ID. The PAN, or personal area network, is separated from other networks through its PAN ID. 
This is a 16-bit identifier that all nodes in the same PAN will share. So it's something akin to a subnet mask in the internet world that you generally would only be communicating with devices within your local network, which is the PAN in this case. The identifier is placed into the low-level MAC layer header in every outgoing packet and allows devices that receive the packet to filter out messages that don't pertain to their network. They can compare it against their own PAN ID and decide if this is a message from someone in their own network or if it's someone in a different network that just happens to be on the channel so there's no need to try to decode or decrypt it. The PAN ID is chosen by the coordinator upon network formation because the PAN ID is distinguishing factor between one network and another it should be random to ensure its uniqueness. It's recommended that you select a random 16-bit value for your PAN ID that keeps your network from coinciding with any other network that happens to exist in the area. Now, what if you happen to pick a PAN ID that's already used by another network? Or, what if you did pick a random PAN ID that wasn't in conflict with any network, but later another network grew to overlap yours? If the PAN ID conflict ever happens, the stack can in fact detect such a conflict and can update its PAN ID automatically and inform all the nodes in the network to move to the new PAN ID so that each node can continue communicating with nodes in its original network and exclude anyone on the conflicting network. You may be wondering how the stack does this. Well, it's done through the use of the extended PAN ID, which is another network identifier known by all nodes in the PAN. While the normal short 16-bit PAN ID is transmitted over the air in all packets because it's short and simple, the 64-bit extended PAN ID is rarely transmitted over the air. The extended PAN ID is also unique for every PAN, and it's basically used as backup criteria when the 16-bit PAN ID is not enough to always distinguish one network from another. For instance, when a PAN ID conflict occurs and you want to notify all devices in your network to move, the way that you distinguish your network from the conflicting network is those devices in your network all share the same extended PAN ID. The extended PAN ID is highly unlikely to ever conflict because it has 64 bits compared to the 16 bits in the short PAN ID. The extended PAN ID is also chosen by the coordinator during network formation. It is only sent over the air in response to an active scan when nodes are soliciting the network or when a PAN ID update is occurring. It is also a useful factor in allowing you to select the network. If you're trying to come into a network rather than form one, you might wonder how to tell which networks are available. The way the networks are distinguishable from one another is not only the PAN ID, but also in the extended PAN ID. You might want to do something special where you decide you are only going to use a certain subset of extended PAN IDs so you can distinguish your networks from other networks, but just don't limit yourself too much. Because the more you limit this, the more likely you will have a conflict. And if your extended PAN ID ever conflicts, there's really nothing you can do to fix that. It's a little like a Wi-Fi SSID, except those can be the same between networks, and this one can't. Besides their network-wide criteria, one node is distinguished from another by its individual node address. A node has a short address and a long address. The long address is the IEEE assigned MAC address, or EUI64. This is a 64-bit address that is globally unique, meaning no two IEEE-based radios in the world should ever have the same EUI64. This is generally assigned at manufacturing time. In the case of Silicon Labs EM series chips, they are assigned when the chips come out of our manufacturing facility before they arrive to you, and they will never change. That's how you tell one radio from another. But because 64 bits are a lot of data, this long address is not sent out over the air very often. 
Most of the time, the much shorter 16-bit address is used over the air. This is known as the node ID and is unique within a network, similar to an IP address in the Ethernet world. It is assigned as the node enters the network and is supposed to be unique within that network. There may be two networks, each of which has a node with the same node ID, but because they're different PANs, it doesn't matter. Note that it's possible for two nodes to have chosen the same random node ID when they enter the network. If that happens, much like the PAN ID scheme, there is a method for conflict resolution. When the nodes notice the conflict, based on the EUI64 information as a fallback, they agree upon new addresses. So, nodes can change addresses at runtime if required based on a conflict. In addition to the addresses of the node, there are also concepts of addresses within the node. And I'll briefly explain endpoints and cluster IDs. An 8-bit endpoint defines each application running on a Zigbee node. And a Zigbee node contains one or more endpoints. With the concept of endpoints, different application profiles and multiple logical devices can exist with one physical device. Furthermore, each endpoint can support the functionality of one or more clusters. The cluster ID is a 16-bit value used as an application-specific message type. To learn more about endpoints and clusters, please check out Part 5 of the Zigbee Concepts video series. So, now we've learned about node types, the coordinator, the router, and the end device of different varieties. We've also learned about PAN IDs and extended PAN IDs, and we've learned about addresses, such as the long EUI64 address, the short 16-bit network address or node ID, and logical addresses within the node, such as the endpoint and cluster ID. For more information on these concepts, please refer to UG103.2 Ember Application Development Fundamentals, Zigbee. Please also see other parts of the Zigbee Concept video series for a comprehensive overview of basic Zigbee concepts. Thank you for watching this video course. We hope you learned something useful about Zigbee concepts.